Okay. So, um, next step then, uh, one up from the image target would be to use something like SLAM. I think I already mentioned this once briefly. So, SLAM means simultaneous localization and mapping. So, I'm generating a map of my environment and at the same time, I'm uh, localizing myself within that environment. Um, and the important aspect here is that the, uh, the stereo pairs, which I can use to determine uh, 3D information, are created from motion. So if I'm moving sideways, so then I'm getting successive images which are shifted horizontally. And again, from looking at correspondences between these images, for example, using SIFT or something like that, I can then calculate uh, depth points. Um, this does need quite a lot of processing power, um, and but now that we have quad-core or, or even eight-core uh, smartphones, this is starting to become possible in a large scale. Um, it's still uh, these algorithms usually are still quite fragile. So, for example, they tend to stop working if you only rotate yourself. So they always need really real motion, sideways, up, down, uh, for example. If there's only rotation, then the algorithms tend to stop working. And that makes it actually difficult to use them, for example, in an augmented reality scenario, because then you would tend to look around first, just rotate your head, and that usually causes these, um, these algorithms to fail. Um, I'll see if I can show you an example. Briefly, I hope the network works. Just a moment. So this is actually quite old. This is one of the first examples of the SLAM algorithm running on running on smartphones. And here you can see um, that the algorithm first detects the plane, in this case the desk, and then starts to, to extend this, this map of the environment as more and more data is coming in. And then now that you know where, for example, the, the plane of the desk is, then you can start to um, do some kind of of, uh, of interaction with that, for example. Mm -hmm. So when you have too too fast motion or just rotation, then it will lose the dragon, but it's um, um, robust enough so that it can then refine the Oh yeah, that, that was an interesting thing. I don't know if you noticed that. Let me see if you can just... Uh. I don't know if you can see it, but the, the uh, little 3D figure is now in front of the hand. So the tracking can't really tell. Uh, so of course you get a couple of additional 3D points, but they don't fit into the, um, into the original plane, so they're probably discarded by the algorithm. And uh, then, of course, the nice illusion breaks down because it suddenly doesn't fit anymore. It should be below the head, but uh, because the algorithm isn't, simply isn't built for that, and it's almost 10 years old, actually, so this is quite, quite impressive for the time still, but um, it still um, kind of destroys the, the uh, illusion. 
right. So, so this uh, original implementation was from 2007, um, but it's still very difficult to get a full map of the environment. So this was really optimized to just uh, looking for a single plane, like a desk, for example. Um, if you want to get a really full environment map uh, in 3D, uh, that's still quite difficult even for modern smartphones. Um, all right, so that much for tracking. Are there any more questions about tracking, localization, and so on in general? Okay, so then let's wrap up with one additional aspect, which is interesting. This is uh, often called spatial AR, or also projection mapping. And here we don't have any kind of display which the user wears anymore, but we're directly using the environment as a display. So, um, for example, we project additional images on buildings um, and align that with the structure of the building. There's been this projection festival here in Lima too, which uses that kind of, of uh, interaction. Um, problem, of course, is if you want to do that in a mobile way, then you, you can get really small projectors, um, but they're usually not very bright. So even if you just have uh, ceiling lights on, then you will probably already have difficulty seeing the projection. And what's also uh, a problem here is that uh, regular projectors have just a single focus. This projector here on the ceiling is just focused on the, on the wall and that's fine for this scenario, but when you're projecting somewhere into the room, then you have very different focus distances. And so the image will just be um, in focus at a very short range of distances and everything else will be blurry. The one way around this would be to use laser projectors, which are always in focus, but they are, of course, much more uh, expensive than, uh, than regular projectors. <coughs> Sorry. For this building, for example, of course it works because it's also mostly one single plane which you can focus on. Um, and for this to work in a, in a dynamic environment, then you would, of course, again, also need a, a pretty detailed map of the environment somehow. For the building, of course, you can do that up front and just get a, a drawing or something where you can then create your, your projection. But in, in the real world, uh, this is much more difficult. Even if you would have a proper map of the room, then somebody would, if somebody would just move one of the tables, then your entire projection would maybe start looking, looking weird at that spot. So um, this is still very difficult to do for dynamic environments, but it's also, in the widest sense, some kind of augmented reality. Um, all right, so now fi let's finally uh, briefly look at how can we actually interact with AR. So um, if you're looking through a, through a tablet or something, then you can, of course, just do touch interaction. You all maybe remember the touch projector from a few weeks back. That's also sort of augmented reality with touch interaction. Um, the problem is, of course, you can't do that if you're wearing a head-mounted display. Then you don't have any touch surface which you can actually use. Um, what's sometimes been done is to, uh, or what, what, for example, is also being done in virtual reality, uh, HTC Y, for example, just gives you different controllers which are also trapped and which you can then use to interact with the virtual content. Um, but the most uh, straightforward solution, for the user at least, would be to actually do some kind of optical hand recognition and tracking and really determine how the, the hand is held by the user. And uh, then you can, of course, directly interact with the uh, virtual content. So one solution, again, not a commercial one, but a, but a self-built one I've seen was to put a, a lead motion camera in front of uh, Oculus Rift again. Then you can actually track the hands and use that to directly interact with uh, virtual content. 
Um, in this scenario, we already looked at this as the sixth sense from MIT. Um, you just have these kind of colored, colored uh, markers on your fingertips which are tracked by the camera and which you can use then to interact, which is kind of a, of a trick but still helps to, to actually interact with the, with the virtual content. This is actually also um, uh, spatial augmented reality in the sense where you use a projector to yeah, just project on uh, top of your hand. All right. So I think, oh, one more thing, yeah, applications, of course. This is something which we still don't really have. So um, we have uh, advertisement stuff like IKEA catalog where you can build, put, put uh, a, virtual, a virtual sofa in your, uh, in your living room and see if it fits. Or you have fashion stuff where you can try on different glasses, for example. Um, then, of course, there's the military using stuff like, like weapon sites and so on. Um, there's a few medical applications like this one where you can basically overlay the, uh, the x-ray image over the, the actual foot so you can really get a feeling, uh, the doctor can, a feeling, can get a feeling of what's, what's broken exactly where, for, for example. Um, we have some uh, educational applications and inf informational stuff. There's a little bit of gaming, but none of these are really uh, uh, broad, broad range applications which everyone wants to have. I think there's a lot of stuff going on in engineering, like for example what Jan said. Yeah. When different when people want to take a look at engine, for example. Mm -hmm. Or for example, in electrical engineering, uh, we used it to visualize the magnetic fields or ah, something okay. because mm -hmm. that's something which is hard to grasp. But uh -huh. then with a um, with a tech, you can visualize how mm -hmm. the field looks like when you move the thing. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a good point. That's also kind of educational in a sense. Um, of course, yeah, I've also seen applications for um, engineers which help you fix an engine. That's also a good example. But um, none of them is really for a broad, broad uh, user base, I think. So I haven't really seen anything yet which, which fits that description, which really um, would, be, uh, would be targeted towards a, a broad user base. Um, Okay, I think we're done a little early today, but that's maybe not such a big deal. So, do you have any additional questions or comments? Okay, well, in that case, uh, thanks for listening, and um, yeah, see you next week, I guess. <laughs>